has to tell you what it's all about. It's tough. And when you're there, on the scene, responding, nothing but the best will do. People expect it of you. You expect it from yourself. When the call comes in, there's no substitute for the right decisions, the right equipment, the right protection. There's no time for unproven promises. There may not be a second chance to get it right. Coming up on Working Fire. We go behind the fire line this month in the Midwest to observe the nation's worst ever chlorine leak. And on the West Coast, demonstrators chain themselves together in protest. What would you do? In Hands On, we cover the first of a multi-part hazmat series on chlorine leaks to go with this month's Fireline incident. And we begin another multi-part series on vehicle fires and how to attack them. In Fire Medics, we review the basics and give tips on proper intubation procedure. In Evolutions 2000, we review the story of a firefighter who awakens from a coma. And Fire Chief and Professor Bill Kramer returns with another Kramer vs. Kramer college credit opportunity. All of this is coming up right now on Working Fire. Hello and welcome to Working Fire. I'm Don Marsh. And I'm Gina Curry. In Missouri, we review the worst chlorine leak ever and the risk of death associated with it. And protesters in California have found a new way to demonstrate peacefully, but it's a new headache for emergency responders. When it would all be over, this chlorine leak response outside of St. Louis would be the worst in the nation's history. A hose used to offload chlorine from a rail tank car failed, dispersing a concentrated chlorine cloud over the surrounding area. Basically on a warm day in August, uh, we had a, uh, a call for the, the hazmat team to respond to a rail car leak. That's really what we knew uh, upon our dispatch. And uh, that was about 9.30 in the morning, and we responded to this incident. Uh, we respond through Alpha Pagers, we're an volunteer organization. Uh, we, we're a combination organization of industrial responders and fire department responders. And the command post was about a little over a mile away on Highway 61. We uh, responded to the, to the staging point about halfway there uh, on 55. We received information this was chlorine. It was a chlorine leak. It was at DPC Industries. And uh, that gave us a little bit more information as to what we were going into. As we passed that area on 55, we detected the odor of bleach, so we knew it was a pretty serious leak when, by the time we got there. Uh, I also put uh, several other teams on standby. We had mutual aid agreements with the area teams. I had St. Louis County on standby at the time uh, that we responded to the incident. This leak was very large. We're talking uh, well over 50,000 pounds of chlorine. Uh, the leak was about six feet deep uh, in and around, within probably a, a football field or so around the leak. So it was pretty, pretty deep. Though the chlorine plant had been pre-planned, the hazmat team needed the latest information to determine how to proceed. This is probably the largest incident that we've dealt with, and so responding and, and looking at that cloud go across the, the highway, it, you can't help but for a minute to just look at that in, in, in awe and understand that this is pretty serious. Uh, we're going to need every resource that we have to, to stop this leak, probably. The first thing I look for is the, uh, the plant folks. Um, some individual who is familiar with the operation uh, who we could get some more information. We've pre-planned that facility. We've walked through it several times. So we knew what to, to expect. But uh, on the other hand, we need uh, information now on what has happened, uh, what led up to the, to the spill, what was the cause, if they knew it, any information we could get on the rail car, the facility, what its operating condition was prior to the, to the leak, and if anybody is needed to be rescued. So we knew it wasn't a rescue. Everybody eva had evacuated. So we were in a leak control mode. Uh, it's a little bit of slower, slower mode. And uh, R7, who was the uh, initial uh, responding uh, agency, 
understands the hazmat response mode, which is not your typical fire department mode of rush in and take care of it. A lot of planning, uh, safety information has to be gathered. We had to know what the leak was, where it was, what could we do to stop the leak. Now, we have several tools in our toolbox to make that happen, but we need to know which tools to carry in with us because now we're about a mile away. That's the initial evacuation, initial isolation zone of this type of leak. So we're a mile away. We have to drive with a pickup truck in level A to get to this scene. So there's a lot of planning and information that has to be gathered before we, we make that, that trek because we're, we're on air, we're using breathing air, uh, we're using chemical protective suits that are very expensive, so we have to plan before we make an entry. You're never really sure if everything you do is going to happen the way you planned it. So you have to have some contingencies, and so we did when we, we went in for the first time. We didn't know we were going to be able to stop this leak in one entry. So, um, so you have to plan for that. And takes, that takes people, takes resources. The more times you go in and out of the hot zone, the more times, the more resources that you, that you need to use. Even though Hazmat was the focal point, it was just another sector in the Jefferson R7 Fire Protection District's Incident Command. We are in a supporting role. Uh, we are a sector of the Incident Command System. We are the Hazmat sector. Uh, when we go on the scene, we talk to him, uh, to that commander, establish what it is that we think we're going to do. Once we have a full plan, we brief him on that information so he knows exactly what we're doing. We get some resources from him. We ask for operational level trained firefighters to help us with decontamination process, with helping set up the zones, uh, the, the hot zone and uh, the cold zone. Things of that nature, EMS support, uh, we ask for that. So there are some that water supply. There are some things that we need to do our operation uh, in, in with them. Any miscue in approaching the rail car and affecting the gas shutoff might have meant certain death. Basically, uh, it was our plan to go in to the uh, plant, um, take a look at the rail car, see if there was something we could do to the rail car or to their system to slow or stop the leak. Uh, it was coming out pretty rapidly, so that meant that there was still something pushing it out because it normally doesn't come out of the car in that manner. So they were uh, augmenting the system with a nitrogen blanket, which certainly pressurizes the system a bit and which is what caused some of the rapid release of the, the liquid chlorine, which immediately vaporized into a, into a gas. Um, so our plan was to go in. Uh, we took some instrumentation to measure chlorine. Uh, when we did so at the, at the plant entrance, uh, it, what we call in the business, pegged the tube. In other words, it was such at a concentration that was well over the measuring uh, limits of our instrumentation, which was 1,000 parts per million. So it was well over 1,000 parts per million at the fence line of the plant. Uh, we, we, our plan was to go in, take a look at the rail car, see what we can shut off, see what we can do there, go into the plant itself and try to shut down their systems. They had some automatic shutdown systems which were activated just to make sure the plant was stable. And then once all of that was uh, taken care of, then we could uh, back out and, and worry about the rest of the environment around the plant. Uh, fortunately, we went in. As I say, we used a pickup truck to, to make that response happen. Uh, it's very difficult to drive a pickup truck in level A. I will, I will tell you that. Uh, my partner, Dick, uh, had, a, uh, had a time doing that. Uh, getting to the scene, um, getting into the plant location, and once we got into the fence gate, then we had the six-foot high wall of chlorine gas to deal with, and it's, it makes everything on the ground invisible, which makes it very hazardous to walk through that. When we train as technicians, we train to not walk through clouds of product. This was a case where we had absolutely no choice to do. We had to get to the rail car, so we had to walk through that cloud, and we had to do it very carefully because if any of us had tripped, and walked over, tripped over the rail uh, into the gravel and breached our suit. It would have been a painful, slow uh, death uh, for about five or so minutes. Uh, and that would have been not enough time to get us out of there to, uh, to make an escape. So we had to do it very methodically and carefully. There were a lot of safety concerns that we had. Uh, we were in constant communication with the command post, but they're a mile away. So uh, we had to be very careful about making this type of response. We were able to climb on the rail car. We had two folks stay back as our safety secondary team in the event that one of us went down for some other reason. Uh, both of uh, Dick and I climbed the rail car. We were able to shut all of the both liquid and vapor valves on the chlorine car and shut down the uh, nitrogen system that was uh, attached to the rail car. And with that, 
at after about a minute or so, the uh, the leak had stopped because that shut off the supply of chlorine to to the hose that was uh, shredded and, and leaking. And uh, once that was once that happened. Uh, we were hoping that none of the valves were frozen open, either by the expansion of the gas or by the chlorine corrosion, uh, but it wasn't, and the, the rail car stabilized at that point. And then we went back into the plant itself to shut down all those systems. We had an individual with us. The, the, there was four of us. One of the individuals was from the plant that we took in with us. He was, a, he was one of their hazmat responders. And he, we all made sure that the plant systems were stabilized and shut down, which they were. So once we really made the emergency uh, cease at that point, the leak had stopped, uh, we backed out, and, and then it was a matter of waiting for the chlorine cloud to dissipate. We assumed uh, the worst, which is why we had to call St. Louis County for assistance. Um, we were maybe going to have to make multiple entries if the rail car was damaged. Uh, some of the tools that we have to, to stop rail car leaks are very heavy uh, because of the nature of a rail car and thus very difficult to get up to the rail car and to actually uh, put them on. So uh, that's what we're, was going through our mind. This first in entry was basically just to identify what the, the real situation was. Stop it if we can, but just see what, what was going on. And we were fortunate enough to do all of what we needed to do at just one time. Chief Siegel recommends building a sufficient resource of manpower. Depending on how the incident goes, you may need it. Our biggest uh, need, uh, I suppose, is, is resources. Um, needing more people, uh, more people to respond, more people trained, uh, more people in the fire service around us uh, trained, uh, which would have, would have sped up the response. We need more resources, and I told the governor that. We need more funding. Uh, I wish that we had more people on hand at the time initially. I wish we had more firefighters that were trained to the operations level to, to handle uh, and to assist us. Uh, but, you know, when you're dealing with an organization like ours that is entirely volunteer, and this was at the one of the southernmost areas of, of the county of the 600 and some odd square miles of Jefferson County, that, you know, it took some time for us to get there. We cover chlorine leak responses in depth a little bit later on in Hands On. In San Francisco, protesters have found a new way to chain themselves together. Working Fire has a solution if your department ever needs to respond. Welcome back to the Chronicle of Morning News. Time now 9.09. You're taking uh, a look here now from video from San Francisco, one of several places here where there is protesting going on. This is at Van Ness Avenue in San Francisco at Fell Street. And you can see that these protesters have linked themselves together. Fire department officials have gone in and unlinked them, I believe by cutting through some of that piping and the, the chaining they've done to themselves. And then peacefully they've uh, gone into what is now uh, a muni bus, a lot been packed into muni buses and police cars and, and taken into custody. No word yet on how many arrests in San Francisco, but boy, quite a few as people protest this war in Iraq. Uh, initially those shackles were brought about from the fur protesters probably uh, six, seven years ago, and uh, the protesters from the Iraq War, they used probably four or five different kinds. Most of them were, uh, they were plastic with a metal sheathing around the middle with a rebar pipe welded in between the, the middle and some of them had ropes in there, some of them had nothing at all in there, um, but for the most part they were wrapped in chicken wire and then the chicken wire was wrapped with duct tape and their thinking was that uh, the duct tape would gum up our saws so what we did when we first got there was to take all the tape off and to see what we were dealing with there was some of them were fully metal pipes that were an eighth of an inch thick. Uh, some of them were a little less thick. Uh, well, we, we first came out with a small Dremel tool and we were using that and we were burning a lot of blades. So we came out with the XL98 and as soon as a few of them saw the XL98 being fired up and starting, uh, a couple of them right away just gave up and said, hey, I'll take my hand out. A couple of them uh, waited a little while and they started 
seeing the smoke coming out of the end of the pipe and then they gave up and then the rest of them they held tight and we ended up cutting them out but we cut out probably 25 to 30 of them about four minutes a piece and we used our XL98 to cut a square hole right next to uh, where the rebar was welded welded in there enough so we could uh, bend that square hole open and unhook the carabiners or cut the rope that they had tied to the the rebar and then release their hands took two big blocks and put it underneath the the tube that forced their arms up and their hands back so we wouldn't uh, come close to cutting their hand or the finger uh, then we covered them up with a tarp that they had there um, we used the metal cutting blade on our XL98 to cut through the metal on the pipe and we used a metal cutting blade on our Dremel tool to do the finishing cuts on the metal and then uh, we initially started scoring the pipe till we got almost through it and then we used our Dremel tool to make the finishing cuts so uh, we could gauge the depth with that a little bit better we initially made the two cuts, the deep cuts uh, on the vertical side. We would made a deep cut on a horizontal side and the fourth cut we were just uh, scoring the metal and then we were using a thick heavy screwdriver to pry the metal back and it was just popping right off. So uh, The next procedure would be just to reach in and undo the carabiner from the rebar post or if they had ropes tied to it just to cut the rope. You really have to know uh, the, the weight of the saw, the amount of pressure you're putting onto the metal post. Uh, you don't want to go too deep because you don't know how far their arms are in there. It's very easy to uh, sink that thing in and just cut somebody's arm off. So. Uh, if you don't have a Dremel tool to do the, f the final finishing cuts through it, I take it very, very slowly. Our thanks to the San Francisco Fire Department for their help in producing this segment. If you have any video of instructive incidents or training segments that your department has been involved in, let Working Fire know about it. You can call us toll free at 800-516-3473. Fax us at 314-352-2555, or you can email to info at workingfire.com. Hazardous materials, specifically chlorine, is the subject of our first hands-on segment this month. As we learned in Fireline this month, chlorine can be bad news. In part one of a multi-part series, we learn more about it. What we did is I went ahead and made up a program and we're going to uh, address a certain uh, chemical or element that we're all pretty familiar with and just kind of run through it and how we would handle it and some of the specifics about it. So what I did is I went ahead and I picked chlorine as the element or the chemical to work with. It's something that all of us are very familiar with. It's in our everyday lives. And I call it chlorine friend or foe. And what we want to look at is, you know, there's, there's two containers, quote, of, of chlorine as we know it. Okay, what we really have to look at it is that is that bottle on the left where it says Clorox, is that really chlorine? I know that it smells better than nasty Okay, it, it smells, it's got to smell, but it's really not chlorine. It has some chlorine or an element of chlorine in it, but it's not really pure chlorine. Okay, on that lower right hand corner, we have a dedicated chlorine car. Now that's real chlorine, that's, that's true elemental chlorine. We say elemental chlorine is not found naturally. It is derived by sending electrical current through compounds such as sodium chloride, which separates out individual compounds and elements. Chlorine is not a natural element. It has to be separated out of natural elements. For instance, we've got sodium chloride in an aqueous form. We put water into it, H2O, in a liquid form. 
They put electricity through it, and what they separate out of that is sodium hydroxide, hydrogen, and our elemental chlorine. And that's how chlorine comes about. And there's a number of chemicals that actually they can separate that out of. Okay, that's just an example for us. So it, it does not, you know, grow on trees per se or come out of the ground. It's something that has to be separated out and then pulled out of it. But obviously, sodium hydroxide and hydrogen are also two other elements that we can use uh, in everyday life. So elemental chlorine obviously would be much too dangerous to use as a household mixture. What we commonly see is not, again, is not that elemental chlorine. It's actually a 5 to 6 percent hypochlorite solution and not pure chlorine. Now the reason I bring this up is the fact that we've all had Clorox bleach before, right? I mean, we've all used it somewhere, okay? If you were to put Clorox bleach and have it splash in your eyes, would it burn? Yeah, yeah big time, okay? Is it irritating to, to, to your nose and throat? Yes. Yeah, very much so, okay? And if you notice, I mean, you know, we do a load of laundry and we use, you know, half a cup or a cup or something like that, so we even dilute it more. And we look at that, and that's, that's a very, very, very diluted portion of chlorine. Okay, to start with, and we all know how bad that is, and what I'm trying to bring up is the fact that if we actually have a true elemental chlorine release, it is bad stuff. Let's look at physical properties of chlorine, some of the stuff we want to think about. Okay, vapor density of chlorine, 2.48. What does that mean? What's air? One. Okay, so 2.48, is it real heavy? Yeah, two and a half times. I mean, this, this stuff, whatever's going to happen with this, it should be going down if it's, if it's in the air. Specific gravity, 1.56, what does that mean? Okay, water's got one, so it's 1.56, so it's definitely heavier. Okay, so if, if this liquid should become mixed with water, we should see it underneath. And why is this all important to us? How many times have we had calls where somebody said, I smell uh, natural gas? And, well, and we show up, and what's the actual smell? You know, it might be propane, it might be a skunk, you know, something like that. So somebody comes up and says, oh, we have a chlorine leak. And you show up, and whatever it is that's leaking is going straight up into the air. What does that tell us? It's probably not chlorine, okay, because by knowing these, this stuff should be hugging the ground, okay? Freezing point, 150 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. What does that tell us? The chances of us seeing chlorine ice, and you will see it, but it has to be under uh, an, uh, basically an uncontrollable condition for us, okay, to see it. Boiling point, 29 degrees below Fahrenheit. What does that tell us? Yeah, if somebody comes up and says, oh, well, uh, you know, we're out in the warehouse and somebody dumped over a bucket of chlorine, and somebody says, well, is it real chlorine? Oh, yeah, it's pure chlorine. You can go back there and look at it. And we, you know, and it's in a liquid form on a 90 degree August day. Guess what? It's not pure chlorine, it's not elemental chlorine. It would be off gas and something fierce. Okay, so we can use this to help troubleshoot, you know, if actually what we're dealing with. Liquid to gas expansion ratio, 457.6 to 1. What does that tell us? It's got a, a large expansion volume. So that's what we have to think about. These are all these things we can look up in the books, okay, and find out, you know, is this really what we're dealing with? Is it acting like it should be acting? It has a, a 2, an 8, and a 7 in its valence is what that's called. Now, why is that important to us? Well, you know, we don't get into it this far at the scene, but why is chlorine, okay, can be such a corrosive or, or so pungent? Why is it such a mixture? And this is why. On that molecular scale, on that molecular level, elements like to have eight electrons in that outer valence. Remember that? Okay. It likes to have eight. How many have we got on this one? Seven. So as it gets thrown out here into the air, it's going to do one of two things. It's either going to gain one, right? It's going to look for that eighth one, bring it in, and now it's happy. Okay? Or it's going to do what? Lose seven. It's going to get rid of seven of them. So chlorine is a very, very active element. It, it likes to get out there and do something. It's not 100% stable by itself. So as it's put out into the air, if it can find that free electron from this chemical here, it's going to glom onto it and something's going to happen. If it can't find one to get hold of and grab on, okay, but there's this whole array of elements out here that's looking for one of its, what's it going to do? Here you go. It's going to shove them off, and it's going to happen extremely fast. Okay, remember, this is a molecular level. So, again, this is, you know, when we get the, the, the experts in the, the uh, hazmat trailer, this is the kind of thing they look at, is that how active, 
can this thing get? And chlorine is an extremely active element. It loves to get along with other things. Department of Transportation regulates transportation of chlorine as a poison gas, but it requires labeling as both an inhalation hazard and a corrosive. It's identified by these two. The one with the, with the number at the bottom is the main hazard. Okay, so if this is up on the side of a truck or on the container, we know it's a corrosive and an inhalation hazard, but the inhalation hazard is the biggie. Okay, that's one we have to pay attention to. If it was reversed, and what would number would be on a corrosive? Eight. Excellent. Okay, so if we had an eight on the corrosive and the, the inhalation hazard were left blank, that would tell us it's inhalation hazard, but the big hazard there is, is the corrosiveness of that chemical. Okay, so it's steering us towards it. Uh, obviously, chlorine is, is a biggie. UNID number is 1017. Again, FPA placard, 704 placarding. Top diamond is what color? Red. Stands for? Fire. Fire, Fire flammability. Scale? Zero to four. Zero meaning? No hazard. No hazard. Okay. Sable's rock couldn't light it with a flare. Okay. And four meaning? Very flammable. Okay. Right hand side. Yellow. Stands for what? Reactivity. Reactivity. Zero meaning stable. Four meaning it's probably reactive to shock. If you hit it with a hammer, it's going to go. Okay. Left side. Blue. Four. Health, zero meaning? No hazard, four meaning? Better be in level A suits, right? Bottom diamond, special hazard, water reactive, oxidizer, uh, radioactive, gosh, there's all kinds of things. Okay, what's our number supposed to be? Right there. Zero, zero, four. Okay, and what's it say at the bottom? OS, stands for what? Oxidizer, oxygen, gives off oxygen. Okay, now we're pulling up on this facility, and somebody's screaming chlorine, 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 okay? And we start to look at this, and we see this four. Well, there's an indication. It probably is. It's giving us a high health hazard. Okay, oxidizer. Do you think it's a strong oxidizer or a weak oxidizer? Strong. Why? Let's go back to that molecular thing. Why would it be so strong? Because it's trying to get rid of seven of these things, okay? It wants to really get going. It's a very active element. If it can find something to throw those electrons off, it will. Okay? It's a very, very strong oxidizer. Okay? So, so far, everything we're looking up and everything they're telling us is making sense. Okay? So what makes the element so bad is the reactions. Chlor elemental chlorine is a very good element for us. Okay, but when it gets to out of hand and gets to react with something that we don't necessarily want it to get along with, it becomes a problem. Okay, here's some things just to give us an idea. Chlorine water. So we take elemental chlorine and it gets out into or mixes with water. Anybody remember what, our, what this could form? Hydrochloric acid. There you go. So hypochlorous acid and hydrochloric acid. Elemental chlorine gets along with the right proportion of water with it. It makes an extremely strong acid. So where would this water come from? It come from your lungs. Yeah. Number one is, if we inhale this stuff and we've got moisture in our body, it's going to react immediately. And it's going to start hurting. Okay? How about uh, our normal weather around St. Louis? Humidity. Humidity. Yeah. I mean, in the morning, you know, on a, on a perfectly clear morning, we get up and there's a film of water or dew on the ground. There's so much humidity. So if we take this and we look at a chlorine leak and we decide, you know what, we'll use water fog on it to disperse the vapors. We'll shove the vapors around using water fog, but what could we be creating? Acid. How strong? Depends on dilution. You know, if we're hitting it with a deck gun, it may not be that strong, okay? So these are things we want to think about is what is what it makes. Next month, we simulate leaking chlorine in the field and practice our response. We'll be right back after this. FirehouseDecals.com is the fire service's premier supplier of stock and custom decals, lapel pins, patches, and custom logoed or company merchandise. Don't redesign your department or company logo or reorder decals or emblems of your current logo until you contact FirehouseDecals.com. FirehouseDecals.com has hundreds of in-stock decals for immediate shipment and produces reflective 3M Scotchlight helmet tetrahedrons, letters, and numbers, plus custom-embroidered department and company patches, specializing 
in both stock and custom work for your fire, EMS, rescue, or police department. FDNY, St. Florian, and Ethnic Decals, and Decals with a Sense of Humor, FirehouseDecals.com can accommodate you. If we don't have it, we'll design it. How about in-stock state and country decals, star of life decals, and single letters and numbers so you can make your own? Plus designs on mouse pads, bar stools, t-shirts, ball caps, coffee mugs, and other merchandise. We're a supporter of the Fallen Firefighters Foundation. We're your one-stop shop for all your logo applications. That's www.firehousedecals.com. This month we also begin a multi-part series on vehicle fires. We start in the classroom, then put it into practice. As a small volunteer department, it's difficult to have assigned tasks for our personnel whenever they arrive on the scene. It's important to continuously stress the safety and importance that goes along with the varied tasks and to make sure everybody's working together as a team to put out the fire. With the varying levels of experience, it's also important to make sure that the basics are continuously covered so that everyone can feel safe with the, the most primitive of steps on, a, on an incident, such as a car fire. That way we can build on that into the future. Uh, with the more complex tasks. The amount of aggressiveness that can be shown towards any incident is based on the manpower that you might have and the experience of the manpower that arrives. So starting with the basics helps build confidence for our more difficult evolutions. Older cars got shock absorbing bumpers. Shock absorbing bumpers can let go about knee high if you're approaching the vehicle from the front or approaching the vehicle from the back. They can let go and cut your knees off right at, at that point, okay? They will usually let go on one side or the other. It will go around, okay? So you want to clear an area, probably the width of the vehicle, and come in at a 45-degree angle if you're going to fight the fire, okay? Standard procedure, okay? Same way with a... A rear 45 degree angle, try to take that hose and get in there. What we're trying to advocate is two lines, okay? One line is going to hit the shock absorbing bumpers, cool that, and take and cool the gas tank. The other one's going to take care of the fire, okay? It doesn't take that much water. If a car is involved and pulled off the road and he's set the grass on fire underneath, okay, it's burning underneath. Sweep the car underneath going up. You will usually put the fire out by sweeping it with one nozzle, okay? It, and it can be the one that protects the shock absorbing bumpers, the gas tanks, anything underneath. The other line don't have to be on yet unless the flames are uh, preventing us to get close enough to do this. Do we have a standard policy of going around and raising the hood, getting the hood open and disconnecting the battery cables? Okay, that should be probably standard policy to take and disconnect the battery cables. Which one do you disconnect first? A negative cable, okay, instead of the positive one. And hopefully that will disconnect the thing. As a precautionary measure, I would do both. Go ahead and do it if you can do it. Just take both of them off. Just forget it about just doing one and saying it's clear. If you have an engine fire and you cannot, first thing you should do is the, the thing of forcible entry. Try before you pry. Go try to get in the inside of the car, open up the car door, pull a release, and see if you can get that hood popped. It's got real hot, it's fully involved, and you go up and try to pull that thing, it's melted the cable. It does not work anymore. The best thing to do is probably go with the corner of the hood, get it down under there, pry it up, and stick the nozzle in. Do you have a piercing nozzle? You don't need a hammer. You can take this thing and go like this and boom, punch it right down through the, the hood of the car, turn it on, and you got the fire out. Same way within the trunk, you can do that. Okay, go through the back tail lights, 
put the piercing nozzle through the back tail lights and turn it on and you got the trunk fire out. This is a tool used for opening a hood if the cable has been melted by the fire. Essentially the cleats along the top end allow you to inject or to place the, the tool through the opening in the grill. It would grab the wire that connects to the, um, the hood release. As you go in you can turn it. It'll twist the wire around the tool, essentially grabbing it and squeezing it tight. As it does that, then the hood release will, re um, will be released. Then you grab the hood secondary latch that's on most vehicles and pop that up. It stores easy in the compartment, approximately three feet long, and as it goes in, the T-handle allows you to crank it um, to, re to loosen the cable. I went ahead and shut the hood of the car. In case the cable's burned through on the inside, this tool will allow you to reach in and twist the cable to unlatch it. You should be able to see the cable right inside, right there it is. All right. Booyah! Look at that. The cable is broken somewhere else. He's able to pull it on the outside and get it done. You two are the forcible entry people. We're going to have a vehicle fire in the engine compartment. Okay? This is going to be this is going to be closed. You'll have to take the two and you'll have to go in there and pop that open. It's going to be burning. Okay? What we're going to do is approach from a 45 degree angle. Right. Come up here. Going to sweep the bumpers first. Okay? Then the other line is going to go around to the front of the automobile and go through the grill here and see if he can knock the fire down or out and then let the force of winter people come up here, twist the latch, take the hood up, take one of your tools, prop it up, and let the team go ahead and fight the fire. In the first evolution, we simulated a car fire under a hood. Essentially, in this instance, we're concerned about working as a team to make sure that we don't have opposing um, practicals trying to be accomplished. It's important that you don't direct fire streams at each other or that you're not pushing the fire or pushing the smoke towards other responders so that we can have a, a more unified approach. In this instance, there was varying tasks that were assigned one to sweep the ground to make sure that any fire that was falling down put out the fire also to reemphasize the point that as you hit the ground much of the water stream and and steam will rise up underneath the car to help with the putting out the fire at this time we cleared a space or cleared the fire and the uh, heat from the forcible entry team that would gain access to the hood in this evolution we probably have twelve people working which is uncharacteristic for many of our incidents as a small volunteer department we may respond with with three to five people depending on staffing availability so in this instance we're able to be aggressive and have multiple people doing individualized tasks whenever on a real incident you may have one person that has to do multiple tasks um, aggressiveness and time are there for um, changed. You can't be quite as aggressive with a smaller team. You also take more time to accomplish a task. But it was important for each team member to understand their own individual task and then to be able to watch other people's tasks so that they could gain the knowledge. If you can sweep it down there, come up here, turn it on a fog and get up here about eight foot from it and spray it up underneath there until you don't see any more fire. Then shut it down. Stay down there and look, okay? Watch for the fire. Once you've cleared this, sweep along the shock absorbing bumpers here. And you have to do that before these guys can come around here with their hose, spray it through the engine compartment. Once they spray it and knock it down, okay? Force some winter people should be right behind them and when they shut the nozzle down they just step aside a little bit and wait to see if there's any flare up. Force some winter people will open this up, prop the hood up and take their other tool and rake through anything that needs to be overhauled. Okay? It's that quick and that simple. Remember, try before you pry. It'll make the, your job a lot, lots easier, people. You'll get into it a lot better. Now, since this stuff is plastic and it gives, if you have to pry this thing up with a tool, you 
you're going to have to have two tools if you're going to pry it up, one on either side of the latch. Okay? And it's tough to do. This thing will give away. You have nothing to pry from. So what you'll have to do is come over here at the corner, put a bar in there and pry it up to the corner and then shoot in it that way. Because it's going to be a ruin anyway and it don't have to worry. We'll be back next month with some additional vehicle fire scenarios. Maintaining an airway is critical for EMS responders, and we examine that next on Fire Medics. Improper intubation is one of the leading causes of insurance casualties against departments. Let's review the proper procedures. We're here today to talk about endotracheal intubation and how to do it safely and how to avoid some of the common pitfalls that paramedics will experience when they're doing endotracheal intubations. The first thing we'll talk about is some of the different equipment that we'll use, and I'll show you the different pieces of the equipment, and then we'll demonstrate an actual endotracheal intubation on this mannequin here. The first thing to remember about endotracheal intubation and airway management in general is that you have to have a patent airway in order for it to be able to be managed and to ventilate a patient effectively. So the very first thing that we look for when we're managing a patient's airway is the ability to ventilate effectively. We do this by one of two methods. We either use a head tilt chin lift position in order to open up the airway or we can use a modified jaw thrust which is only going to be used in the cases of spinal cord injury. The head tilt chin lift is a much easier method to use and it's much more effective and doesn't provide as much strain on the rescuer. So that will be the, the procedure that we will use today. Once we have the patient and they are in the proper position with the head tilt chin lift, we should be able to ventilate the patient and provide adequate oxygenation for them while we prepare for our intubation procedure. One of the most important things to providing good ventilations is this, is making sure we have our bag hooked up to 15 liters of oxygen, providing 100% oxygenation, and we have a good, tight mask seal. The rubber mask has to come in contact with the face and prevent any air from escaping around the mouth when you try to ventilate the patient. Some of the clinical parameters that we're looking for when we're ventilating the patient is good chest rise and fall and a lack of belly in insufflation and a lack of air going down into the belly. When we ventilate these patients, we need to do it nice and slowly over the course of one and a half to two seconds, making sure we have good rise and fall, and making sure we don't squeeze the bag very rapidly. We need to ventilate an adult patient about 20 times a minute, between 12 and 20 times a minute, and one of the biggest pitfalls that we run into is adrenaline. When we're managing a patient's airway, we end up doing what we call EMS Olympics, where they squeeze the bag as quickly as possible for as long as they can. And what happens is most of that air then ends up going into the, into the belly and providing for a, for a huge belly and making our intubation and other things more difficult. So the first thing that we were going to do to demonstrate our airway management of this patient, endotracheal intubation, I'm going to use Rick. Rick is going to assist me, and he's going to provide the ventilation for the patient while I prepare my intubation equipment. Once we have a patient who's being ventilated, we like to have an airway in place. That way it doesn't have to be hold the airway open using a head tilt chin lift. We insert the oral airway hook side up to the back of the airway, twisting it down into place, coming to rest on the lips. This is going to provide an open airway by moving the tongue out of the way. And then Rick is going to place the bag on the patient's face, and he's going to provide bag valve mask ventilations at a rate of about once every five seconds, looking for good chest rise and fall. While Rick is doing his ventilation, I'm going to check and make sure I have all my equipment that I'm going to need to do the endotracheal intubation. Pieces of equipment that are going to be vital, we need to have a stethoscope in order to listen to the lung sounds. We need to have a suction unit available. One of the common pitfalls for endotracheal intubation is a large amount of bleeding or vomitus that occurs in the oropharynx. When, people, when patients vomit or they have bleeding going on in the mouth from trauma, we have to remove the vomitus and the liquid from the airway so we have a clean intubation. So we need to have our suction unit ready. We need to have something to hold the tube once it's in place. This is a commercially made endotracheal tube holder. We can also use this or we can use one inch or three inch tape in order to hold the tube in place. We need to have our endotracheal tube. These come in different sizes based on the size of your patient 
and the need that you're going to do, whether you're going to intubate either nasally or endotracheally. We're going to end intubate endotracheal today, so we're going to use an 8.0 endotracheal tube. And you'll notice there's also kind of a malleable device. We call this a stylet. It needs to be inserted into the tubes. One of the common pitfalls that paramedics can run into is the failure to use a stylet in their endotracheal tube. The stylet is a malleable device that gets placed inside the endotracheal tube by the paramedic, and it gives the tube some rigidity, so it's able to be shaped or placed into the glottic opening or between the vocal cords when we intubate. We also want to make sure that we have a 10 cc syringe available to where we can fill the distal cuff once we place the tube in the patient's lung. And this is going to provide a secure airway as it fills up the trachea with the balloon. One of the other things I want to make sure that I have ready, or if things go badly with my intubation, is a pair of McGill forceps if I have to remove some sort of obstruction that I find, and my different confirmation devices that I'm going to use. The, fir the foremost confirmation device is going to be the stethoscope, where I'm going to listen to the chest and listen over the epigastric space to so make sure that we have good ventilations and no air going into the belly. These two other devices, this is a color metric end tidal CO2 detector, which is going to detect the amount of carbon dioxide dioxide in the exhaled air that the patient has, and this is also an esophageal in indicator device which we're going to place on the end of a tube and it's going to tell me whether the tube is in the right place or not, if it's in the esophagus or if it's in the trachea like it should be. We also have a digital version of this color metric device which is the one that we use here at the St. Charles County Ambulance District which provides a little more of a quantitative type measurement of carbon dioxide in our patient. So we have Rick getting ready for his endotracheal intubation. At this time, I'm going to choose a laryngoscope and a laryngoscope blade. This is a Macintosh blade. This is a number four Macintosh blade, and it's going to facilitate me to intubate the patient and place the tube in the trachea. So I have my device. I make sure my bulb is tight and white, making sure it has a bright light, because that's the only way I'm going to be able to see once I place this into the mouth. I need to have a light that works. So it works. I have my endotracheal tube that I'm going to need and I have my stethoscope available. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and have Rick give me about three or four ventilations in rapid succession to hyperoxygenate the patient. All right. When Rick is through, we're going to remove the oropharyngeal airway because we won't be able to intubate around that. We're going to place the patient's head in a position where the chin is high and the forehead is low. What this does is facilitate us to be able to view the trachea and the glottic opening with less force. We place the tube or the laryngoscope into the vallecula, which allows us to visualize the vocal cords, which is what we're looking for. We take our endotracheal tube and we place the tube between the vocal cords and pass it. Generally, in an adult patient, we stop between 23 and 25 millimeters on the tube, and the gradients are marked on the tube. Once the tube is in place and we've seen it pass right through the glottic opening, we'll go ahead and put 10 cc's of air into the balloon. We'll always hold the tube. One of the biggest problems we see with adrenaline and a procedure like this is the tendency to remove the tube or pull the tube or pull on it when we're trying to uh, secure the tube in place. We're going to hold the tube in place while Rick comes over and attaches the bag valve device to the endotracheal tube. After the device is placed, we'll go ahead and confirm tube placement by listening to lung sounds and the epigastric area. We'll place the stethoscope over the stomach and we listen for any kind of gurgling or air movement in the belly. And then we listen to the lungs on left to right to make sure that we have good equal rise and fall and good swooshes of air coming through. Now, one of the big things that we may recognize when we're listening to lung sounds is the fact that the tube may be advanced too far. And if the tube gets advanced too far, it's going to have the tendency to go into the right main stem bronchus or the right division of the trachea. And at that point, the patient's only going to be effectively ventilated on the right side. To correct that problem, we're going to, we're going to deflate the bubble on the endotracheal tube and slightly back the tube out until we get good breath sounds on both sides, both left and right. And then reinflate the balloon on the distal end of the endotracheal tube. Once I have that and I've confirmed that it's in place, I have some secondary confirmation devices that I'll try to use. If, Rick, you want to remove the endotracheal tube, this is called an esophageal detector. I put it on top of the tube and we sque with it squeezed and we let go. If it's in the trachea, which is a rigid structure, the balloon will go right back to its normal size. If this was actually in the esophagus, when I squeezed it and put it on, it would actually stay squeezed because it would suck the soft tissue of the esophagus 
and prevent it from actually expanding again. Our other secondary device is our end tidal carbon dioxide detector. And it is a machine that quantitatively measures the carbon dioxide through the exhaled air. The bag valve map clips right under the top of it. And we have a device that will measure it. And as we ventilate the patient and the patient would exhale, their exhaled air would go by, it would give us a measurement on this device in millimeters of mercury. Generally, for a normal patient, we look for between 35 and 45 millimeters of mercury on our end tidal CO2 detector. Once all of those devices are in place and we're confirmed, last but not least, we want to make sure that we secure the device. One of the biggest pitfalls that we run into with endotracheal intubation is tube dislodgement as well. And some of the things to remember is to always make sure your tube is secured and to always check your tube after any time the patient is moved. Well, this is a commercially made device where the tube slips into an opening and then into the patient's mouth between their teeth. It has a thumb set screw where you can tighten the tube and lock it into place and a strap that feeds behind the head and then back through and secures the patient's head in place. Now we have an endotracheal intubated patient. We have all of our clin clinical parameters measuring end tidal carbon dioxide and looking for good chest rise and fall. If the patient has a pulse, at this point, we'd probably go ahead and use a pulse oximeter, which will tell us the oxygenation that's taking place in the body, looking for generally between 95 and 100 percent at this point. The pitfalls we talked about earlier with right main stem bronchial intubation, the trachea tends to, to lean to the right side in more of a straight fashion and square it off on the left side, so it's much easier for the tube to slide into the right side. And the space from where we stop our intubation at the glottic opening to the point of the carina where the trachea actually separates is only about two to three inches. And when you have an endotracheal tube and a patient's head that's flexing and it's not properly secured, it's very easy to either push the tube too far or remove the tube from the glottic opening, and then your patient will no longer be intubated. So it's, it's very important to pay close attention to the placement of your tube and the measurement and the marks to make sure that the tube stays in the same place throughout the entire resuscitation process of your patient. The other option to orotracheal intubation is nasotracheal intubation. And generally, we use nasotracheal intubation when we have a patient who's still breathing on their own and needs a secure airway, or they have a patient who has a very active gag reflex. We can try to pass it nasotracheally as opposed to orotracheal, where we have to use a big laryngoscope and place it into their mouth. For a nasotracheal intubation, we use a commercially made device called a BAM, which is a slight whistle. We have a patient who's breathing, so as they exhale air through the tube, we'll hear a whistling sound as they do that. So we pick a nair. We'll start with the right nair and insert the tube. And the tube, in a gentle twisting motion, should pass right through and into the back of the throat. And we start to listen. Now, it's important for the patient's head to be in somewhat of a neutral position when we advance the tube. If you have a conscious patient and you're inserting the, the ET tube nasotracheally, you can sometimes have the patient swallow. As the patient swallows, it has a tendency to clamp down the esophagus and draw the trachea further posterior in the pharynx where you can actually line up the trachea more easily. So as we insert the device, we start to lis listen for the whistling sound that it makes. And you can hear the whistle. And once we hear the whistle, we'll advance the tube. And we'll go ahead and inflate the bulb, just like we did in our, our endotracheal intubation. And once the tube is in place, we'll then use some tape, tape around the tube and hold it to the nose and the nares. And then we'll get our bag valve mask. And just like we did with our endotracheal intubation, we'll be able to ventilate the patient, looking for good chest rise and fall. And this is just as secure as an airway, as an endotracheal intubation, orally, but it has a, a little, the tube will actually be a little further down when you look at it, so you won't be able to use the same indicators that you do for orotracheal intubation as the markings on the tube. Our thanks to the St. Charles County, Missouri Ambulance District for its assistance in this segment. In Evolutions 2000, we have the heartwarming story of a firefighter returned to us. And Chief and Professor Bill Kramer has another college credit opportunity for you in Kramer vs. Kramer. It's amazing. 
it was amazing when he started recognizing people after nine and a half years. You can only imagine. Simon Menka is Don's uncle. He's speaking on behalf of the family. He says Saturday afternoon, Don suddenly started talking in full sentences. The first thing he said, I want to talk to my wife. At which time the staff here put him on the phone with Linda, and he was carrying on a phone conversation with Linda. Before long, the whole family was there, including three of Don's four sons, friends, and fellow firefighters. Don Herbert talked for 14 hours straight. The conversations and the uh, memories were basically talking to the family, uh, wondering how his boys were, how they were doing. We've experienced a miracle here in, in Buffalo for his family and for his comrades. That miracle came Saturday afternoon when Buffalo firefighter Don Herbert asked to speak with his wife Linda, a startling request considering for nearly 10 years Herbert suffered from a debilitating brain injury brought on by this fire. There was a snow load on the roof and all of a sudden this whole roof just collapsed in on these men. At that time there was an announcement that somebody was was trapped up in the uh, attic unbeknownst to me being Don, my brother-in-law. He was without oxygen for at least six minutes, leaving him in a coma for nearly three months. One neurologist calls this case a mystery, saying perhaps the same chemicals that wake us up in the morning were not functioning in the firefighter's brain. I know anecdotally there's a less than five cases in the world where people years out have woken up after you know a severe brain injury but nothing like this uh, this far out. As cynical as I am and a lot of other firemen are it makes you stop and think about the power of prayer. That is a great story and you know it's a reminder that we should never give up hope. That is so true Don. Chief and Professor Bill Kramer is back with this month's Kramer versus Kramer. Thanks, and what a great series of stories again on Working Fire Video. I was really impressed with the way the firefighters handled the major chlorine incident, an incident so massive that the red zone stretched for an entire mile. Well, I don't know, we saw a car fire where firefighters were really in danger. After all, there is a possibility, although remote, of an exploding fuel tank, there are burning synthetics, and maybe firefighters should actually wear masks while they're combating car fires. I think it's the small fire that presents real danger. Even a room and contents fire with the potential of a ceiling collapse or an explosive atmosphere could indeed be more dangerous than that large incident, which really doesn't occur very often. Well, I think it's the large incidents that have the most danger, based strictly on the magnitude. And look at the condition of the truck that had to enter that red zone. If it'll do that much damage to a truck, the corrosiveness, just think what that incident would have done to the human beings had they been unprotected. Yeah, but these large incidents are rare, and there's usually a very wide red zone. And firefighters, for the most part, can be placed on the perimeter, really pretty much out of the main danger. Well, now it's really the large incidents that have the greatest amount of danger, strictly because they are so large. There's unknown dangers in massive quantities that could face not only firefighters, but civilians as well. Okay, well now for the college questions. A chance to earn one more credit hour toward a fire science degree. Question number one. What is more dangerous for firefighters? Large scale fires and hazmat incidents or smaller routine incidents such as room fires and car fires? Number two. What is more taxing and fatiguing for firefighters? large-scale fires and hazmat incidents, or smaller routine incidents such as room fires and car fires. And number three, explain why your answers to the above two questions are the same or why they are different. That concludes our questions this time. For a Working Fire, I'm Bill Kramer. Get your fire science degree by enrolling in Working Fire's continuing education program through the University of Cincinnati. Call Working Fire toll-free at 800-516-3473 to find out how. And don't forget our new address. Working Fire Training Systems, 6974 Chippewa, St. Louis, Missouri, 63109. That's it for this edition of Working Fire. Thanks for watching. See you next time, and stay safe.